It took me a long time to come around to uh, harm reduction. Being in the 911 service my entire career, um, I, I felt like it was giving somebody permission to do drugs and I struggled with it because we saw the same people over and over and over. And I've come to realize that again, you know, um, people that overdose, if you don't help them they and they die, they don't ever recover. They don't ever get that second chance. And you know, most overdoses are accidental. I kind of relate it to, um, well, my job, fire service. Uh, in every building you go into, you would see a fire extinguisher, right? Does that mean that people are coming every to your building to start fires just because you have a fire extinguisher? No. <laughs> so get Narcan on your premises. Let everybody know that it's there if you need it and, and have it when it's available. Next up, we have Mitch Doig. He's from Bridges to Change, one of our recovery centers here in Clackamas County. Uh, housekeeping. I'm a big hands talker, so I'm 50% less capable right now with this in my hand. <laughs> Um, and I talk fast sometimes, so if anybody wants to like volunteer to say, Mitch, slow down, I will gladly accept that. <laughs> um, one final thing is, uh, because so this is supposed to be an overview of treatment that's available in the area. I didn't want to leave any specific agency out or talk more about my program or any of those things, so I'm actually not going to name any specific agencies. I can help you find those if you are interested, but more what I want to be going over today is uh, what to like, kind of that what to expect when you're expecting model of what to look for when you're looking for treatment um, and kind of like what treatment actually is. I always joke around, uh, it would be really great if almost every treatment program had an orientation of here's how to use us better. So hopefully this will help you help other people too. But, oh. Which one is it? Before we do that, though, I have a story um, to kind of help demonstrate this process. Uh, in 2010, I had my first client. It was really exciting for me. And uh, she did really, really well in our program, transitioned to a lower level of care. We'll talk about what that means later. And went home for Christmas. We were living, our program was away from her family. She went home and like a lot of people found her old community and had told her mom like, hey, I'm gonna go to a meeting, I'm gonna go get some support, disappeared for a couple hours. And uh, meanwhile, I'm in Newport with my family on Christmas Eve and this was a small agency I worked at where our personal phones were our work phones. A phone number calls me that I'm not familiar with, call it or answer the phone. And the, that is this person's mom saying, I don't know what to do. My client had, or my daughter, overdosed. The ER found her. She was covered wet or covered in water. Um, somebody just dumped her off. They didn't know what to do. I'm worried about her. Days went by. She was okay. But what had happened was that her friends, the people that cared about her, were scared of getting in trouble, didn't know how to help, tried the kind of classic throw her in a shower, see what happens. And she was without oxygen for about five minutes. Um, that we know of anyway. <laughs> and um, the thing that I want to kind of think about today is how the information that we're sharing today could help her in particular. So we'll come back to her story um, and kind of think about how a change in view could actually help her. Um, something she told me early on in our work together was that she felt like she was in treatment because she hadn't run out of luck yet. And I would much prefer that the people we're helping aren't relying on luck. It's like very important. So, oh, I keep doing that. So the first thing to do to explain treatment is to explain this little thing called the ASAM criteria, which is something I spend a lot of my days talking about. Um, ASAM stands for the American Society of Addiction Medicine and is used from nurses to counselors to mentors to doctors, P, uh, MDs. A lot of people use the ASAM. Uh, we sometimes refer to an assessment as an ASAM. Really, it's just the criteria we're using to determine the dosage of treatment that's needed. So dosage, um, we'll talk about in just a little, or actually, dosage is kind of seen by how severe the problem is based on a couple factors. And so that starts with prevention, that is people who don't meet uh, criteria for substance use disorder but maybe need some kind of assistance. 
outpatient, then intensive outpatient, residential, withdrawal management, which most people know as detox. So um, that's kind of the broad stroke for adolescents. This looks likely different. There's actually a couple jumps in between depending on your needs. Um, see, I still get the hand move. It's good. So um, the way we come to a determination about what level of service someone needs has to do with six different areas. Those areas are the drugs they're using and their withdrawal potential for those drugs, their health, their mental health, where they are in kind of the continuum of change. We call that readiness to change. Um, that could be their motivations or why, how serious or important that is. Um, how likely it is they'll continue having problems. We might also refer to that as relapse. And their recovery environment. What, like how they're living, who they're living with, the support factors and a lot of other things. So uh, there's really not a fun metric where we can say like, because it's this bad in one area, it needs to be this or so on. So what I always like to kind of explain to people if you're trying to help somebody very quickly is residential is reserved for folks who are like, oh my gosh, I really need to, but because my environment, I don't know how to. It's just gonna be impossible. Intensive outpatient is if I have a lot of support and structure, I think I could do this. Outpatient is with minimal support and structure, I think I can do this. Or something to consider with outpatient is somebody else is wanting me to do this and I'm on the fence but I'm willing to try something. That's also just as important as anybody else in this continuum. Uh, detox is uh, for folks who need medical assistance to be stable. Um, that's specific to uh, withdrawal from a substance. There's a kind of a gap in here, which I believe, I will name drop somebody, I think DePaul actually has a 3.7 now, which is uh, residential that can provide some medical support, which is really cool. Um, so that's a brief overview of what the ASAM criteria is. The thing that I wanted to spend a little bit more time on, um, I'm going to keep doing that, is kind of the range in what treatment might look like for folks. Because a uh, show of hands, how many of you have watched a TV show where somebody goes to their therapist and they just talk about their lives over and over and over every week? That's what most people think therapy is. <laughs> And um, counseling can be that way. I have definitely utilized my EAP service sometimes to have that. Plug for EAP. So um, I think really uh, drug and alcohol treatment is a very intentional act though. And a lot of times we get lost in this idea of I need to go to a six month program or a nine month program or a 30 day program and I need to graduate and I need to move on with my life. I'm fixed. And as I used to tell the parents of the teenagers I would work with, your son or daughter or child is not a TV. I can't fix them that easy. So it's going to look a little bit different. So that could range from relapse prevention planning to developing different coping skills, kind of working on the underlying reasons that we might be using substances. Um, something that the person who I spoke about earlier had told me was she really liked heroin. Well, first it was Oxy. She was part of the second wave that April had mentioned earlier um, of people that kind of transitioned from one opioid to another. Felt like a warm hug. It was something that made her feel important, wanted, and relieved pain. Not just physical pain, but more importantly probably to her was emotional pain. So a lot of the things we tend to work with are things that uh, cause a lot of emotional pain. And uh, that doesn't mean having to revisit trauma. One of the really beautiful things that's been happening um, that I've got to see a big chunk of for substance use treatment is we've moved away from this idea that we need to force you through change. We need to traumatize you into changing. Um, we need you to revisit your skeletons in your closet. Really what we're trying to do now is figure out, hey, what's going to work best for you? Um, one of the really neat things that happened with the ASAM criteria's most recent addition is a move towards more people-centered language. Um, it's really important to remember how much our words impact others. And so um, there's no longer thing, we don't actually say the word addict in treatment. That's not something that comes up. It's something that is a self, like a self-label. It's really important that people have the power to choose who they are. Another thing that I don't advocate for is words of, or I advocate against is 
words of judgment. Um, it's not a positive UA. It's not a dirty UA. You're not clean. You're not dirty. Uh, you're somebody who's using substances or not. Your UA had illicit substance in it or didn't. So um, our treatment should, the things that we should look for in treatment anyway, should kind of follow suit. So right now we're at a place where we're looking for relapse prevention planning. Um, I had a kiddo who one time said, I'm not going to stop doing it, but I want to do it safely. She created a binder that had all of the doctor's offices that were going to be near her, needle exchange clinics, um, places that she could go to like just talk, drop-in centers. And that was just so she didn't have problems. Um, it, can, it can look however people need it to look. A lot of times it is, here are the safe people that I can go to. Here are the safe places I can go to. Uh, communication skills. Believe it or not, not all of us have those. Um, actually, this is one of the reasons that I said I always wished that everybody would go to treatment is just to learn some assertive communication. It's good for us all. Um, emotional regulation. One of the things that people will tout a lot now is DBT. There's kind of four sections of DBT, one of them being emotional regulation. Um, I recommend that. Uh, sexual health is one of the kind of the newer things, and I would encourage you, if you have somebody who has kind of had a repeated history of relapse, to see if you can find them a program that offers sexual health and recovery groups of some sort. Uh, Douglas Harvey created a curriculum specifically to help this program who is discharging about 50% of their folks for sex in treatment or any kind of related activity. And what they found is just by providing a space for people to talk about how sex might be linked to their drug use, uh, those discharges dropped by about 35% and their increase successes went up dramatically as well. Um, smoking cessation. Um, Let's see here. Um, the ones that I want to focus on a little bit before I move on is pain management, especially because we're talking about opioid uses, um, value clarification, and motivational enhancement. Um, can I just get a show of hands? How many of you refer people to treatment services? Okay. Um, one of the things that I'm always curious about as a follow-up to that is how many times have they said, I want to, before you referred them? Or actually, how the majority, a show of hands, the majority of people say, I want to, before you send them. So 25%, I would say. Um, and that's okay. I think the important lesson that I want us to all take away with, or go away with today is that um, people aren't motivated. We have motivation, like periods of motivation. It's January right now, so the gyms are all busy. Um, my fridge has more vegetables in it. Um, and that doesn't mean that like two months ago I also didn't have the same kind of concern. But that also doesn't mean that um, I didn't need the help then too. So one of the things that we've been working on I think as a field is focusing more on how our values and the things that are actually getting away and getting in the way of change. And one of those ones that's missed is pain. Um, I used to work at a methadone program and people neglect their bodies when they're neglecting their bodies. And a lot of times, one of the most common myths in methadone treatment is that methadone will destroy your bones. And one of the things that I often found was that people would have neglected back injuries, knee injuries, anything of the sort. They're no longer using a substance that will treat that pain. And now they feel like their bones are falling apart. And so finding some kind of way to provide them with skills for pain management that oftentimes actually work with their emotional regulation skills is invaluable. Um, value clarification, um, it's really related to motivational enhancements. We want to figure out what changes are important to folks, why they may want to make them, and then help them make those changes specifically. Um, one of my favorite things about my job, or at least the job I help others do now, is that it's not about what I want. At the end of the day, it's what the person that we're trying to help is willing to do. And so if somebody is hoping to come in and say, you know, my mom, Actually, this is a true story. I had a kiddo who would come in and say, my mom always is on me about me coming home and smelling like weed. And I remember thinking, like, 
okay, like I get it. You should just not do that. <laughs> um, and uh, what was more important to this person in particular was that their mom stopped yelling at them. It wasn't actually the act of going to their friend's house after school and getting high. It was that they just didn't want to have the problems with their mom anymore. So what we found out is you remove one behavior, the thing that they don't want disappears, everything's fixed. But if I were to speak at them and be, hey, you better stop. Come on, we've been over this three weeks in a row now. Now it's been eight. Um, you don't see the movement. So it's really important to speak to people um, through the lens, the lens of change that they're also seeing. Um, okay. Now the thing that I want to echo that I think has been in the theme today is shame. Uh, stigma in particular. Um, I think every presenter has talked about just reducing stigma and the importance that that has. For treatment specifically, it has a really, really, really big impact. So uh, we're fortunate enough in Portland to have a ACT Institute, so that's uh, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, and they do a lot of really great research. Um, famously, one of these studies, I can't remember which, uh, they finished, were about to submit, and I think the title on it is like something about the good things come to those who wait, but uh, they were about to finish this study showing the link between shame and relapse. The day they went to submit it, somebody across the country had beat them to it and found the exact same thing. So we know that this is repeatable. So it's good data too. So uh, three things I want to highlight is that shame about one's problematic past may increase rather than decrease future occurrences. So me making somebody feel bad about their choice to use a substance actually will make them do that more, not less. Um, the second being that shame is the emotional core of self-stigma, which actually causes people to have a delay in seeking treatment, they drop out of treatment more regularly, and they have poor social functioning. Um, one of the other things that's related to that is that people will stay in treatment longer than they need to, which actually causes a um, bigger impact on society as a whole. And they don't get to practice the skills we've been working so hard to teach them because it's specific to residential treatment, which is very expensive. I don't know the rates of it now, but when I was still in a uh, setting, like the first week, the first day was $860 for that one person. So it has a tremendous cost. Um, more than that, though, we've been able to find that shame is directly related to the amount that somebody will use the substance and how likely it is that they will relapse within the next six months. Um, I think it's the second study. Uh, they, what they did to look at shame body language, or what they found was that shame body language is the most um, accurate predictor. So they would interview somebody, and if within the first seven seconds they showed any kind of shame body language, drooping of their shoulders, looking down, talking quieter, it was more likely that within the next six months they would relapse and how bad that relapse would be. So us being able to say to like the person that I mentioned earlier today that, hey, your life is important whether or not you're making the change I want is actually going to help them later if they ever choose to make the change that we would hope they would. So it's not about saying, hey, doing this thing. It's about saying, while you're doing this thing, you are important still. Because I think the message that we've been sending is, you're a degenerate, all of these things that you do make society worse. How dare you? Why would you do this to your mom, brother, sister, blah, 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 blah. And really, it's we're people, and people have been using substances since the dawn of time. And it just so happens that the substance that sometimes clicks with these individuals is very dangerous. Um, so... One of the things that I think is really wonderful is trying to figure out how we could fit the Narcan, Naloxone into a treatment setting. So things that we've done, in particular in my agency, that I think are easily rec uh, replicatable, and a big part of that is because of April and the rest of the team's work, Thank you. Um, is that we can have Narcan available in common office settings. We have, like, in our first aid box, it just says Narcan instead. Um, it's available. Sometimes they mysteriously go missing and we just quickly replace them and that's great. <laughs> um, we can do agency sponsored events to provide training. All of our current clients have watched the Narcan response video. We have it available at all. Uh, by the way, we provide housing to our folks as well. So all of their houses have Narcan and um, 
something that's been really fun is occasionally just walk into the lobby and be like, hey, does anybody want Narcan? And just like sitting down and watching a short video. And one of the gentlemen that was there had said, yeah, I'm bound to be by somebody one time that's going to overdose in the future. Because remember, our folks are going to repeatedly be around others who have the same problems. Um, and finally, figuring out a way to get Narcan in the hands of folks who are exiting the program, whether successfully or unsuccessfully. Just saying, hey, it may not even be for you. I understand that you just use stimulants, but here you go anyway. It's not going to hurt anything. Um, so the thing that I want to kind of think about is how this could have benefited the person that I shared um, about earlier. What if she had been able to educate the folks that she was around and said, hey, this is in my purse. If anything bad happens, here you go. That whole, like, whatever happened while she was out might not have happened. The people around her might have been way less fearful. She might not have just been dumped off under an awning. Um, her mom might have felt differently about the whole situation. And, and probably more importantly, we wouldn't have had the conversations about the shame and guilt she had about scaring her family and potentially dying when she got back. It would have been a much different outcome.